Welcome to our 2016 ASMA webinar series. Thank you to United Health Foundation for supporting this webinar series, and a special welcome to our United Health Foundation partners and ASMA Action Coalition joining us across the Upper Midwest. Before we get started, we have a few housekeeping items to cover. All lines will be muted. If you have a question during or at the end of the presentation, Please, you, please use the chat box function in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. A copy of the recording um, will be available today um, in our follow-up email, and please um, share that with your colleagues. We also invite you to register for our May and June webinars, and we will include links in our follow-up email, and that information is available on our landing page. And now I'd like to welcome Ed Corazala, who will be presenting today's webinar on masqueraders of asthma. Ed is the director of the pulmonary lab at the University of Minnesota. And thank you for joining us today. I'll turn it over to Ed. Thank you, Ruby. It's a great pleasure to be here with my friends at the American Lung Association. To talk about again about masqueraders of asthma. This is my second um, webinar about masqueraders. Um, the previous one has been archived. I pulled out some new cases, so hopefully you'll find this interesting. I believe this is my seventh webinar in all over the last five or six years, but Jill just told me I think it's actually eight, so I have that wrong. I lose track after a while. So here we go, let's get started. So all that wheezes is not asthma. It's a very famous quote made by Dr. Jackson in the Boston Medical Quarterly in 1865. At the time, Dr. Jackson was concerned about foreign body aspiration causing wheezing and being misdiagnosed as asthma. Today, this anecdote reminds us that there are many causes for wheezing and shortness of breath besides the common and classic diagnosis of asthma. And what he's doing right here, you probably can't see it on your screen, but he has drawn here as a the trachea leading down to two main stem bronchi. And right there, he's got a foreign body that he's pointing at. And he says down here in the caption, all that wheezes is not asthma, but it often is. Tell you the truth, that one in 10 kids have asthma nowadays. And so if you take a guess, most of the time, kids probably got asthma. So anyway, I googled, like we all do nowadays, I googled all that wheezes is not asthma. And here's our first case. So this is an 18-year-old Caucasian man, normally fit and healthy, presented to the Accident and Emergency Department, this of course is in the UK, with a two-day history of chest tightness and wheeze. On exam examination, he was afebrile and he knew hemodynamically stable, oxygen saturation 97 on room air. Listening to the chest revealed widespread bronchi throughout the lung fields. Peak expiratory flow was 265 liters per minute pre-bronchial dilator, and after the bronchial dilator, it was 4 point, or 445 liters per minute. He was sent for a chest x-ray, and on his return, he started coughing persistently, resulting in coughing up a tooth. On further questioning, he stated that he had been assaulted two days earlier prior at the start of his respiratory symptoms. And the x-ray confirmed, as you can see right here, right on a main stem bronchi, just like Dr. Jackson worried about, there's the tooth. A group of my friends in the pulmonary lab were chatting the other day, thinking about maybe writing a book about things people have coughed up. Believe it or not, I've seen a lot of different things. So anyway, things that can masquerade as severe asthma. This is right out of ATS 2014, Dr. Chung. You can see there's lots of stuff on the list, right? Dysfunctional breathing, vocal cords, COPD, bronchiolitis obliviant, which is now called cryptogenic organizing pneumonitis, which is COPE. The boop went to COP. Anyway, lots of stuff, congestive heart failure. And of course, there's another list just as long for kids. 
the threat out of the American thoracic societies, things that can masquerade as asthma, especially severe asthma. I think before we can talk about masquerades for asthma, we have to first define asthma, and that's not very easy. So the definition of asthma, according to the NAEPP ER, EPR3 expert panel from 2007, right? Chronic disorder of the airway that involves complex interactions of airflow obstruction, bronchial hyperresponsiveness, and the underlying inflammation. Inflammation that directly affect airway caliber and airflow and underlying bronchial hyperresponsiveness. Let's skip to the middle here. In susceptible individuals, this inflammation causes recurrent episodes of wheezing, breathlessness, chest tightness, and coughing, particularly at night or early in the morning. This interaction can be highly variable among patients and within patients over time. It's one of the reasons why it's really hard to pin down asthma because it's transient. Sometimes they breathe normal and sometimes they don't. Just for fun, I developed a Wordle for the asthma definition. And what do we see that kind of pops up? How Wordles work is words that are used the most become bigger on the Wordle. You can go to a website and Google Wordle and play with this from anything that you want. Obstruction comes up pretty big. Obviously, airflow is pretty big on the Wordle. Inflammation is big. Hyperresponsiveness. The definition talks almost entirely about airflow obstruction, airflow limitation. That's one of the definitions. The physiological definition of asthma is an airflow obstruction that shows significant response to bronchodilatation. What I'm showing you here is the flow volume loop. It's something that we see all the time in the pulmonary lab. The normal loop, of course, is the blue one that shows almost a straight line here on the expiratory limb. This is the patient blowing out, blowing out their air. Now you see this little scoopiness here in the loop? Getting worse and worse and worse. That's mild, moderate, and severe asthma in the sense of airflow obstruction. We like to divide triggers into both allergens and irritants. Allergens are IgE-mediated type reactions that cause airflow obstruction in asthmatics. These are actually in the order of importance in Minnesota. Ragweed is the number one aeroallergen associated with asthma, with 65% of the patients being affected. Cats, number two, about 60% of the people in Minnesota are hot to cat. Mites, next, then pollens, molds, and roach. Interesting enough, if you go to other locations, like our sister study that was done in Mexico City, cockroach was the number one aeroallergen associated with asthma. And then we have irritants. Certainly smoke is a powerful trigger for asthma, but you're not allergic to smoke. Same with exercise. Some patient exercise triggers bronchial obstruction, but we're not allergic to exercise, although many of my patients tell me they are. Airway inflammation, upper respiratory tract infections, viruses, certainly rhinovirus is a powerful trigger for asthma. And the leukotrienes, LTC4 and LTD4, powerful bronchial constrictors. In parts per billion, they can clamp down an airway, and hence all the research that have gone into the anti-leukotrienes. And things over on the right side, things that decrease airflow obstruction, obviously if you avoid your triggers, take anti-inflammatins, anti-leukotrienes, bronchial dilators. Caffeine is a mild bronchial dilator. Obviously rest after exercise is a bronchial dilator, epinephrine, and anti-IgEs. And I have a few more that I should add to this list since we have some new medications that recently came out, like the anti-IL-4, or excuse me, anti-IL-5 and anti-IL-11 for asthma. New biologicals that are coming. Let's go back again. What is asthma? It's airflow obstruction that is at least partially reversible. It's defined as a reversible or transient airflow obstruction where the FEV1 increases by 12% or a minimum of 200 cc's after bronchial dilatation. So what is airflow obstruction? Evidently, since the definition of asthma has airflow obstruction in it, 
we have to define what airflow obstruction is. According to the American Thoracic Society, airflow obstruction is an FEV1 over the vital capacity below the fifth percentile. I like to use a simple form of what we call as the rule of 10 down from predicted. So in other words, if the ratio predicted is 80 and the patient blows a ratio of 70, we'll say that the patient has airflow obstruction. I'll show you that in a case study in a minute. So here we go. First off, the American Thoracic Society wants us to determine if it's a good test. And how we determine if it's a good test is we want to make sure that it's a smooth, continuous curve all the way to the first second. The beginning of the study here, the flow volume loop is used to tell if it's a smooth, continuous curve, if it has a peak, if it has a rapid rise, all the things that the American Thoracic Society suggests that's a good flow loop. We also then go over here to look at the volume time curve to make sure they blew a minimum of six seconds. The volume time curve is volume versus time, where the flow volume curve is flow versus volume. So this is a good curve according to the American Thoracic Society. The first thing we need to do is determine whether it's a good test or not. This is a good test. This is just review. Flow volume loop curve provide the means for quality assessing during the initial portion of the forced vital capacity maneuver. Peak flows, rapid rise, traceability equals repeatability. Vol volume time curve, the spirometry curve, can be used to evaluate the latter part of the vital capacity. Did it plateau? Did they blow for six seconds? Did they get out all their air? It's so important that we have the patient get out all their air because it's the ratio of the FEV1 over the vital capacity that determines the ratio. And if we don't get a good vital capacity, we're going to miss the ratio. So now let's go ahead and take a look. This patient's predicted ratio is 82. In other words, they should blow 82% of their air out in the first second, but they're only blowing 70 Notice on my spirometer and my reports, anything that's below the lower limits of normal is highlighted in red. It also has a little star next to it, so when we fax it to a place that doesn't have a color printer, they'll be able to see that it's below the lower limits of normal. Notice that the predicted is 83. If we would have taken 10 away from 83, that would be 73. 73 would have been the lower limits of normal in this case. So over here is what we're saying. If the FEV1 over the vital capacity is below the lower limits of normal, or down 10, we say that the patient has airflow obstruction. Well, that's part of asthma. We have to determine that they have airflow obstruction. And in this particular case, according to the American Thoracic Society, they have a mild airflow obstruction. The next thing we need to do is we need to determine whether they have reversible airflow obstruction. I read this little one here, and it says mild airflow obstruction that shows significant response to bronchial dilator is consistent with the diagnosis of asthma. My little circle here is supposed to be right over that 18 there, so it must have moved on me a little bit. But anyway, what we're finding out here is the FEV1, the FEV1 is how much air comes out in the first second. So before bronchial dilator, 3.56 liters came out in the first second. After bronchial dilator, 4.19 liters came out. The change was 18%. American Thoracic Society suggests it has to move by a minimum of 12% or 200 cc's. As we can see, it moved way more than 200 cc's, and it moved 18%. So this mild airflow obstruction that shows nice response to bronchial dilator is consistent with the diagnosis of asthma. We would then have to look at the asthma guidelines to determine the said severity of asthma. And those of you that are asthma educators out there will know that an FEV1 of 73% is moderate persistent asthma, according to the asthma guidelines, and should be treated with a middle dose of inhaled corticosteroids. All right, case number two. Now, we didn't get the audience response hooked up for this little talk, so I'm just going to talk you through this particular one. So in this particular case, 
what we're going to do is we're going to first off is we're going to notice that the predicted ratio is 82. Notice here that the actual pre-bronchal dilator blow, the ratio was 83. We'll look at the curve. The blue one is the pre. And then you can see the breath in here. Now, after bronchial dilator, and this is how this one was misdiagnosed with asthma, the response was 26%. And normally what I do in this, in this kind of a case, I would ask the audience, okay, what do you think? Does this patient have asthma? And I have the audience response here. All right, you guys can answer it for you. The question is yes, no, can't tell, bad test. Oops, sorry, I went backwards. Can't tell bad test. The answer to this one is actually can't tell bad test. It's a little hard to tell, but if you look at this particular curve, right, this is the pre bronchial dilator curve. Notice that there's only one, but also the curve comes back behind the line on the inspiration. So then when I played back this particular spirometry, and I asked the person who did it, why did they only do one breathing test? And they told me because it was all normal. Well, the American Thoracic Society wants us to always do three tests because there's a learning curve to spirometry. What happened is after the bronchial dilator, the patient took a bigger breath and blew bigger, blew bigger numbers, and this nice response to bronchial dilator had nothing to do with the fact that a bronchial dilator was given, just about the fact that the patient took a bigger breath, ended up getting bigger numbers. This patient was misdiagnosed with asthma, basically because of a bad test. Fortunately, the physician was really sharp and came to me and said, I don't think this guy's got asthma. Why don't you play back this study? Which I did, was happy to do, and we eventually found out that the patient didn't have asthma. So this is Dr. Gary Cott from National Jewish, really smart guy, and he goes, how often do physicians on the front lines get the diagnosis of asthma wrong? We have to be a little careful with this data because this is a tertiary center just like the University of Minnesota is. A series of 350 consecutive patients referred to a tertiary center with pre-established diagnosis of asthma, all of whom were already on treatment for the disease, a fully 25% did not have asthma at all. And that's about the same as we would find if we did the data at the University of Minnesota, too. A mere 5% were found to have only asthma. What we have to be careful with this kind of data is, is that usually in a tertiary center, people with just run-of-the-mill asthma aren't sent there. It's the patients that most of the time in primary care, they get the diagnosis right. Probably 90% of the time is one study that I read. It's the 10% that end up getting on a lot of asthma medicines. Sometimes they get escalated to higher doses of asthma medicines. And when those medicines don't work, they get sent to the University of Minnesota, or in this case, National Jewish. Well, of course, a high percentage of those aren't going to have asthma because the asthma medicines didn't work. Those are the ones that end up in our lab. Matter of fact, I did a study just recently on all the methacholines that I've done at the University of Minnesota. Now, methacholine is a is a test for bronchial hyperresponsiveness. Believe it or not, 95% of all the methacholines that we've done in the last five years were negative. And the reason why is usually the patient had already been put on asthma medications and they didn't get better. And so the physician still had the wonder, do you think they have asthma? Well, here's the summary of what I'm trying to talk about, is the truth is if the asthma don't work, start, asthma medications don't work, start thinking about a masquerader because the vast majority of asthmatics can be easily maintained on low-dose inhaled corticosteroids. He also continued, Dr. Cott from National Jewish, in contrast to asthma, which is defined physiologically, airflow obstruction that is transient or reversible, chronic bronchitis is a historical definition. These are the most common types According to Dr. Cox, he says the two top masqueraders of asthma are emphysema and chronic bronchitis. Chronic bronchitis is a historical definition, a condition involving cough 
in excess sputum production for at least three months per year in at least the last two years. And of course, emphysema is a histological definition. You go in and you look at a piece of the lung, and if they've lost alveolar septi, it's then defined as emphysema. So can we differentiate asthma from COPD with baseline spirometry? And I think this is some of the problem, is because the truth is, we can't. I'm going to show you a slide, just another day in the pulmonary lab. These two cases, and you can look at these curves, and you can look at the data. And again, over here, the C, look at the curve, and look at the data. Last time I gave this talk as a masquerader of asthma, we played through both of these cases. A, right, is the asthma case, showed nice response to bronchodilator in a perfectly normal diffusion capacity. C, showed no response to bronchial dilatation and a significantly reduced diffusion capacity, more consistent with COPD. Even though baseline, just taking a look at these flow volume loops, they look almost identical. And the numbers are almost identical, if you look at the numbers. And that's the problem. Many times in primary care, especially primary care where I've gone down and do review of their systems and checked out their spirometry quality, very, very rarely do I see post-bronchal dilator studies. They just don't have the time in primary care to, to wait the 15 minutes after giving bronchal dilators. So many times they might see an abnormal spirometry curve, but it's hard for them to differentiate between asthma and COPD because they're not doing the response to bronchal dilator part, which is so important to divide asthma from COPD. Another way that can be done, and many times our primary care docs do this, is they'll put the patients on bronchial dilator meds or they'll put them on a low-dose inhaled corticosteroids and see what happens when they come back. Another perfectly good way to determine if somebody has asthma or COPD. If you put the patient on asthma meds and nothing happens to their flow volume loop, they probably have more likely COPD. Whereas if they have asthma, they should have significant response. Like in this particular case, after a low-dose inhaled corticosteroid and a bronchial dilator, it perfectly normalized this flow loop. It was all normal afterward. Same patient getting the same treatment over here with COPD. There was absolutely no change in their spirometry. And, of course, there's a lot of crossover of this disease. We can see asthma. This is according to the N. Haynes database. Asthma, chronic bronchitis, emphysema. There's a huge overlap. And now there's even a word for that. They're calling it the asthma COPD overlap syndrome, or ACOS. And there's been a consensus statement now from the American College, 2014, defining it. And the question is, is it faced with a differential diagnosis equally balanced between asthma and COPD? The default position would treat the patient accordingly for asthma. That was their statement. So lots of things can masquerade as asthma. A big study that I'm involved with right now is this couch potato-ism, right? So we got a lot of kids running around the soccer field and all different kinds of things, a hockey place, you know, all the, sucking on their inhalers, right? And so we're running them through a bunch of exercise challenges, methacholine challenges, and guess what? A lot of them don't have asthma. So let's try case number three. It's a 21-year-old female with chronic non-productive cough since childhood. Her triggers are exercise, laughing, and sex. The funny things that patients will tell you some days, you know what she said to me? She said, you know, you're not very sexy when you're coughing. And I go, that's probably true. She's an aerobics instructor, and the cough is affecting her ability to work. Asthma meds don't seem to help her cough. Current med, she's on high-dose inhaled corticosteroid and a long-acting bronchial dilator, and she's also taking albuterol. She was sent to the University of Minnesota Pulmonary Lab for a methacholine challenge, and the challenge was, deter was de deferred because of the findings. Here's her flow volume loop. She didn't notice her FVC is perfectly normal. Her FEV1 is 99%, which is normal. 
and her ratio is normal within the normal range. They'd be highlighted in red if they were below the lower limits of normal. And we can also see that her predicted is 86. Her ratio would have to be below 76 before she's, we would say she has obstruction. But what we notice is abnormal is her peak flows. And we see this truncated loop, flattening of expiratory loop, flattening of the inspiratory loop. And again, we can see from our we had a, another audience response question, and you can go ahead and decide what you were going to do in this case. So is this a variable interthoracic obstruction, a fixed upper airway obstruction, variable extrathoracic obstruction, or vocal cord paralysis? Truth is, it's a fixed upper airway obstruction. See how it's flattened on both inspiratory and expiratory? The variable ones are only bad on one side. In other words, this one's it's truncated on expiration where it has a normal inspiration. Variable extrathoracic upper airway obstruction, this is what we see most commonly in vocal cord dysfunction, vocal cord paralysis, is it's abnormal on the inspiration, pretty normal on the expiration. Caveats here is the FEV1 is a poor indicator of large airway obstruction. Even though she had very severe truncation, her FEV1 was still normal. But again, if people have severe obstruction, significant tracheal stenosis may not be apparent in the flow volume loop if they have very severe obstruction. In her case, she didn't. So I'm showing you here that peak flows was the problem. The peak inspiratory flow was below the lower limits of normal expiratory flow, excuse me, and the peak inspiratory flow was significantly below normal. Flattened loops. And then we can see the average normal trachea is about 24 milliliters, or millimeters, excuse me, in diameter. That's the average adult tracheal diameter. And we can see here, as we truncate it, we can truncate the airway quite a bit before we see significant flattening of the tops and bottom. She was somewhere between these two here. So her airway was actually probably about seven millimeters in diameter. Almost three times, or almost a third the size of it should be. All different kinds of tracheal stenosis, all depending on where they could be in the airway here. Um, they can be in the larynx, they can be subglottal, just below the larynx. They can be down on the trachea. They can be all different places I've seen them. Hers was actually right here. It was a subglottal stenosis. One of these tracheal rings here, she probably had it all of her life. Instead of being soft on this side, it was cartilage all the way around. This is cartilage here, and this is open. And it's usually so that your esophagus right here, so when you swallow, this can move. Your esophagus sits right on the back side of the trachea. So that's why sometimes people, when they have, especially when they have esophageal rings like this, they have problems swallowing too. Didn't have that history, but a lot of coughing. So the treatment, general treatment, Conclude include tracheal dilation. In this particular case, she was uh, they inflated a balloon. I'll show you pictures of that. Tracheal dilation is used to temporarily enlarge the airway. Then you have to do tracheal resection or reconstitution. There's some experiments going on now at the University of Minnesota, at least on animals, where they're using 3D printing of the trachea matrix and then recellularizing that matrix with the patient's own cell. So it's kind of a new way to do a tracheal transplant. You can do laser surgeries and, of course, put in stents. We've done a lot of stents at the University of Minnesota, especially patients that have had lung transplants. Sometimes during near their astomoses, they'll end up getting a weak part of their trachea where the lung has been stitched back together, um, and then I'll have to put a stent in. There's her airway before and after she was dilated. See now that the airway is much more open, so that she had a subglottal stenosis. And interesting now, you can see her flow loop is much, much normalized. 
Now I have a peak again. And unfortunately for the young lady, a couple months later, it started to come back. You see, it's flattened again, both on the inspiration and the expiration. And then three months later, it's getting worse again. So her stenosis is returning. And usually her cough will return too as the stenosis gets worse. All right, I want to make sure that you're not confusing upper airway obstructions would have flattened truncated flow loops with just bad efforts. Now this is a person that did a bunch of different flow loops and look at some of these are flattened, flattened look like, but this is just showing you inconsistent efforts on the flow volume loop. If you see a flattened loop on the inspiration or are wondering about vocal cord, send it back to the testing bay, have them do the test again, but this time concentrate on breathing in as fast as they can. If it normalizes, then it's not an anatomical problem. In other words, it's not vocal cord or um, an upper airway dysfunction. It's just a bad test in the sense that they didn't get a hard breath in. That's also why I like to encourage all of my centers to be using full flow volume loops because the flow volume loop can be diagnostic both out, that's where we see if they have airflow obstruction, but also in so that we can check to see if they have an upper airway obstruction like vocal cord dysfunction. All right, case number four. Patient presents to an allergy clinic with a pleasant 26-year-old female, 265 pounds, 60 five inches tall, history of long, unstable asthma, chronic cough being her main complaint. Chronic oral steroid use, report zero exercise tolerance, her current meds, 20 megs of prednisone, 40 megs total a day, Advair 550, using albuterol four to six times a day, and Benadryl 50 milligrams a day. Past medical history, hospitalized both in 1996, 2001, 2003, and 2004 for asthma exacerbations. Well, she blew into our spirometers, and we see that she has a mild restrictive event here. She has very low vital capacity. This could be because of her heavy weight, large BMI in this case. But what we notice first off is we see this flattening of the inspiratory limb. See the flattening here? Fairly normal expiration, although it's too small. Her vital capacity is too small, only 65%. And after bronchodilation, only a 7% change. Not consistent with asthma in the sense of seeing airflow obstruction, which she really doesn't have. So her ratio is normal. It's predicted to 78, and she blew 80. More like a restrictive pattern. But when we look at the inspiration, we see that she has a hard time doing the inspiration. There's many flow loops here, and I had the tech have them breathe in as hard as they can, and it's still truncated. The air comes in very slowly on the inspiration. More like this, where we have an abnormal inspiration and a fairly normal expiration. So this is the veritable extrathoracic obstruction. Extrathoracic means it's above the corona, so it's, a, it's not inside the chest. It's in the upper airway. So she got herself a trip to ENT, where they went in and did a scope, and it was performed to evaluate vocal cord dysfunction with multiple inspirations, approximately 10 inspirations. Our ENT doc noted two episodes of paradoxical vocal cord motion. I also noted that the region was significantly erythema and edema consistent with reflux disease. It's very common for reflux to cause the vocal cords to dysfunction. So she was sent for a pH probe, which was very positive. Um, reflux with coughing. Started her on some more uh, proton pump inhibitors. And then she was coming back in a month. So the normal vocal cords, right? open. When you breathe in, normal inspiration, the vocal cords fold open. And when you breathe out, they close so we can phonate. That little part right there gives us the ability to speak. In her particular situation, what was happening on inhalation, the cords were closing. 
and that was what was causing her problem getting the air in. She had inspiratory stridor, she had wheeze inspiration. When she was blowing out, the cords would open. So she had classical vocal cord dysfunction. It's a little thing to kind of differentiate between exercise-induced asthma versus vocal cord dysfunction because kids, we have a lot of time, different, hard time differentiating between those. Exercise-induced asthma usually, usually causes expiratory wheeze after intense, moderate duration exercise, usually six to ten minutes of exercise, and it can worsen after completing the exercise. The average nadir, or the lowest point in the FEV1 on an exercise study, is five to seven minutes after exercise. Very common for patients with exercise-induced asthma to say they wheeze worse or cough more after they complete the exercise. Whereas in vocal cord dysfunction, usually the inspiratory strider, strider very early in the exercise session, so they start having this problem within the first minute or two of exercise, and it resolves very quickly, almost immediately after exercise is complete. This is a novel idea that a group at the University of Minnesota and I came up with. This is extremely hard to diagnose in the lab because many times the patient has to be under exercise or some sort of stress for the vocal cord or the exercise-induced asthma to trigger up. And so many times in the lab, even on the exercise treadmill, we can't trigger it. And so what I'm telling parents to do, or coaches to do, is to videotape the event. It's very easy, and I'm, I don't have the slide with me, or actually the videotape with me today. I could show it to you sometime. The inspiratory strider has a prolonged inspiratory phase. In an asthma attack, its expiration is delayed. And so in vocal cord disorders, inspiration is delayed. By actually watching the videotape of the patient having the attack, we can differentiate between asthma and vocal cord dysfunction. And maybe it's the best way to do it, is to actually see if you can get somebody to, to videotape the attack. And I just kind of went down here differentiating. Some people say one textbook suggested that about one in a hundred asthmatics are actually misdiagnosed with asthma who actually have vocal cord dysfunction. Now, I talked to our allergist at the University of Minnesota, Doug McMahon, and he says it's more like what he sees, it's more like one in 20. But again, I think it has to do with the fact that we're a tertiary center. In other words, if it's easy run-of-the-mill asthma, they never come to us. It's the asthmatics that don't get better on their medications that come and see us. Symptoms do not respond to inhaled bronchial dilators. Symptoms typically do not in respond to inhaled or systemic steroids. During the attack, reveals veritable extrathoracic obstruction, flattened inspiratory limb. Barometry is normal when not in an attack. Rapid onset and rapid resolution of symptoms. And again, vocal cord dysfunction rarely occurs during sleep, where asthma can often wake people at night, and they tended to have more problems breathing early in the morning. And of course, severe asthma attacks, severe asthma attacks that would get you hospitalized, results in inflammation and are not completely resolved after bronchial dilator. Whereas many times these people with vocal cord dysfunction have lots of ER admits. Usually it resolves very quickly. So, it's a particular situation I wasn't too proud of, but we decided that the patient at the University of Minnesota, this particular, this is the same person that we did before who has the vocal cord dysfunction, right? Abnormal vocal cords, right? So what we did is we said, well, you don't have asthma, and we took her off her asthma medications, and what we notice now is that her numbers were way worse three days later after being off of asthma medicines. We gave her a, bronch gave her a bronchial dilator, And now we saw a nice response to the bronchial dilator. Numbers now reading almost the same as when she was on her asthma medications. So this unfortunate lady actually has vocal cord dysfunction and asthma. Uh, 
And it's very common, according to the literature, that patients will have both. Matter of fact, about 30% of the patients with asthma also have vocal cord dysfunction. And another study that looked at vocal cord dysfunction found that about 53 or 56% also had coexisting asthma. There's been a lot of in the literature wondering if asthma medications depositing on the vocal cord is actually causing vocal cord dysfunction in some asthmatics. That hasn't been conclusively found yet. All right, case number five. So this is a 40-year-old male we saw a couple weeks ago who coughs a lot. So our fellow noticed signs of autoimmune disease with an elevated SED rate and C-reactive proteins off the chart. He had red, swollen ears, and he first thought that his ears were sunburned. He had a 10-pack year smoking history. His current meds are high-dose combination inhaled corticosteroid and a long-acting bronchial dilator. He was put on teotropium as well. Maybe they thought because of this small smoking history that he might have COPD that's causing his cough. He was on albuterol, taking it four to six times a day, and he reported to me that he didn't think it helped his cough. He was also on prednisone, 20 micrograms a day, or milligrams a day, and he thought that the oral steroids seemed to ease his cough. Of course, I had them blow into the spirometer, and what do we see here is that on all of his flow loops, we see that they're that they're sawtooth. See how gurgly they are? And also I noticed that on the inspiration as well. Right? He had a mild obstruction according to his flow volume loop, but really what I wanted to show you this slide is basically what I was saying here is the results of the test are questionable to the patient's inability to perform the maneuvers according to the American Thoracic Society. The American Thoracic Society says you need a smooth, continuous curve to be a good test. But in this particular case, every single one of them had this sawtoothing appearance. Sometimes that sawtoothing appeared, or the inability to perform the maneuver according to the American Thoracic Society might actually be the dysfunction that we're looking for. What he actually had was called relax, relapsing polychronditis. So it's a deteriorative autoimmune disorder that the cartilages are being eating, eaten away. So what happened is his cartilage in his trachea was being, is also known as red ear syndrome because the cartilage in the ear can be affected as well. All the cartilage in the body can be affected. Usually these patients have arthritic type symptoms too which then on further questioning, he said, oh yeah, my joints are really stiff. Of the people with airway involvement, about, let's see, of the people with airway, oh, here, one-third of the patients had airway involvement, a prevalence of about 21%. So 21% one, of the 145 patients that they looked at had airway involvement. Airway symptoms were the first manifestation of the disease, like in this particular case. He was coughing. That's what brought him in. Dyspia was the most common symptom, followed by cough, strider, and hoarseness. What happened is the polychronditis irritated and eroded away the trachea of his, or eroded away the cartilage in his trachea, so he ended up with tracheomalacia. And that's what caused the airways to make that, he's make a funny noise when he was blowing hard during the spirometry. So they usually end up with expiratory dynamic airway collapse, and that was the sawtoothing that you saw in the flow volume loop. The trachea normally dilates during inspiration and narrows slightly during expiration. When patients have tracheomalacia, this is um, exaggerated. Didn't happen anywhere in the bronchi. All right, so my last slide. So, time to think about masqueraders. When a patient has a normal spirometry, but the symptoms are out of proportion of the FEV1. In other words, if their ACT is really high, but their spirometry is normal, then you start thinking about it. Is that a masquerader? Obviously, poor response 
to asthma medications. The vast majority of asthmatic patients are well controlled under a low dose of inhaled corticosteroids. So if you give them some inhaled corticosteroids and their symptoms don't go away, start thinking masqueraders. Again, abnormal spirometry that gives you an atypical pattern, either truncation or sawtoothing, could possibly be a masquerader of asthma. Thank you, everybody. We're open for questions now. Thank you, Ed. We'll uh, give you all a few um, seconds to get some questions typed into the chat box, and we can begin addressing those as soon as they start showing up. How do you reset the audio? Okay. No questions? Somebody's got to have a question. <laughs> did you notice what was the maximum that we had? 47, 48. 47, okay. Oh, we do, we do have a question. Um, mm -hmm. Does your lab perform flow volume loops during the methacholine challenge? During the methacholine challenge, yeah. You know, that is what a methacholine challenge is. You start out with a baseline flow volume loop, and then you give normal saline by nebulization. You repeat the baseline flow volume loop, and then you slowly increase the concentrations of methacholine. Methacholine is a bronchial constrictor in asthmatics. Non-asthmatics are much less sensitive on the order of 100 to 1,000 times less sensitive to methacholine than asthmatics. That's why methacholine has the ability to help us differentiate between asthma and non-asthmatics. But yeah, you're using a flow volume loop. You're measuring the FEV1 before the methacholine and then after we start with a really, really low dose because you don't want to give somebody too bad of an airflow obstruction, especially if they have bad asthma. And then you slowly increase the concentrations of methacholine. Each time you give a dose of methacholine, you repeat the flow loops to see how much the methacholine affects the patient. And then you give methacholine until you get to the doses where we see people, um, the normal people who don't have asthma start reacting to it. And then we can say the patient has mild, moderate, or severe bronchial hyperresponsiveness. That's what a methacholine really is. Similar to an exercise study, we start out with a baseline flow volume loop, then we exercise the patient, we get them off the treadmill, and we have them blow into the spirometer and see if the exercise caused the airflow obstruction. Good question. Any other questions for us? Don't be shy, ask me a question. Is the reactive airway disease a masquerader of asthma, and how is it different? Uh, you know, that's a difficult question. You know, reactive airways disease is a term that's many times used on young children before they have the ability to do the flow volume loop because the physician isn't really sure if the patient has asthma or not. On the other hand, you might say that any asthmatic has a reactive airway disease. In other words, their airways are more sensitive to triggers. Reactive airways disease is not a term that's really been defined, but I see it in patients' charts all the time, especially in little kids. Um, so I can't really answer that question if it's a masquerader of asthma. Certainly many times when patients have a diagnosis of, of reactive airways as little kids, um, some of those children, like about a third of them, move on to have asthma as adults. Some of them just have a reactive airways disease because when you're little, your airways are so small that anything that causes airflow that causes, a, say, a narrowing, an inflammation in that small little airway will make the kid wheeze. 
like an upper respiratory tract infection, will make little kids wheeze, but it doesn't normally make an adult wheeze, and that all has to do with the size of the airway. Little teeny airways, it's very easy to get them to have turbulent flow. A wheeze actually is turbulent flow inside the airway. Think about it. You can't whistle with your mouth open, right? You have to focus your lips to get a whistle to happen, and that's what happens. The airway narrows enough to cause turbulent flow inside the airway, and then you can hear the wheeze with your stethoscope. Look, we have another question here. Oh, yes, okay, I guess uh, um, Ruby answered that. Yes, this is being recorded. Um, these uh, webinars are archived, and you can uh, play them back. And I believe a copy of uh, the webinar is going to be sent to people. Yes. If you want to share it with your colleagues, okay. I appreciate any feedback um, on the webinar. Um, and we have two more webinars coming up. Can we go to the next slide? What I'm really excited about, um, well, both of them sound really interesting, the impact of hormones on asthma management. And the one I'm really excited about is the June 16th um, one. We have a lot of new asthma medications that are coming out, um, a lot of once-a-day meds, um, some new biologicals. So I'm very excited about this talk about fitting the recently released medications into the new asthma guidelines. Because um, most of the, the guidelines were published in 2007, and most of these medications that just came out aren't in the guidelines. So it's going to be really interesting to see what we have to say about that. If there aren't any more questions, Really appreciate everybody spending your lunch hour with Ruby and I. We had a great time giving the talk. Thank you.